right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Lisa Kristen, who is all the way over in Switzerland. How are you doing, Lisa? Hey, John, I'm doing great. How are you today? Um, fantastic. And Lisa is the uh, CEO, uh, executive coach, facilitator, consultant of Christian Coaching and Consulting. And what we're going to talk about today is, is something I think that's challenging a lot of people now is that, yes, we're in the 21st century, um, but in many ways we are still... Um, you know, we're still operating as if we were in the 20th century and and leadership and the skills needed to lead organizations and move them forward in the 21st century um, are different than the ones needed in the, in the 20th century. And I'm not sure everybody has made that intellectual leap yet. So, so um, Lisa, when you talk about the human skills required for leadership in the 21st century, let, let's, just, let's just bottom line it. How different are they from the skills that you would have needed before? Ooh, they're night and day different. And the reason is really obvious. In the 20th century, we were going for efficiency. We wanted everything to be uniform. We had mm -hmm. stability, we wanted certainty. And so we built systems for that. It was perfect. The problem is we need the exact opposite for 21st century, where everything is ambiguous, it's fast paced, we have digital technologies, and we have no idea where we're going to go. So we don't want uniformity, we want innovation, for example. So to make this shift is something everybody needs to do, but it's really difficult. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's interesting that you just mentioned that, you know, about all the digital, because one of the things that we have seen during what the pandemic has highlighted is that prior to the pandemic, like everybody knew they needed to get digital processes in place and they needed to transition into being more you know, digitally driven. But let's face it, even large companies, there was a lot of lip service paid to it. But then the pandemic came along and said, hey, okay, you guys didn't, uh, didn't heed warning. So now this byproduct of this is going to be that it's gonna lay bare those companies that haven't got good digital processes and aren't even in the process of, of migrating to that. Yeah, I mean, what's really interesting is I would say exactly as you said, everybody knew digitalization was coming. It was on everybody's tongues. People were starting to get there. I mean, I would say during this pandemic, we've probably moved at least 10 years, like lightning speed fast in terms mm -hmm. of how fast will people adapt to that. But what I think is the most interesting part of what came out of this pandemic is actually people realize it's not the technology, it's the human stuff. Right. And this I've been beating that drum for years. And that was really hard. That's the soft stuff. We need digital skills, Lisa. We need to know how to do new processes and how to do the mm -hmm. systems. And now they're like, oh, we get it now. It's the people. It's the people and how we work together and how we come together as a team. Oh, yeah, because let's face it, I mean, you can digitize all the processes you want, but if those are not good processes and if the people, you know, if they haven't been developed to actually help people do their jobs better and interact better with customers or whatever, whatever, then it's, it's, a, it's kind of a waste of time. But that's an interesting point you raise about the, you know, the soft skills. And I hate that term, to be honest with you, soft skills. Me I think too. that's why, I think that's why, um, I think it's a self-defeating term. And I think it's very easy. If you go to somebody and say, oh, I want some soft skills training. What's the first thing that's going to get cut in any budget? It's going to be anything with soft and <laughs> next to its name. <laughs> but to your point is, I don't think people realize that digital goes hand in hand with people. I, I mean, it's exactly that the human skills, everything that's really easy that could be done without that, that's not complicated that's you know repetitive that's now already being done in the digital world by computers right mm -hmm. so the only tasks that are left for us to do are the really complicated really confusing really creative really like we need everybody on the team to put all these thoughts together to come up with a solution 
And if you're going to do that, you need to know how do we work together as a team? How do we communicate? How do we make sure that the best ideas are being heard through diversity? How are we expanding our thinking versus just saying we need to do what's always been there for us, right? There's all of this is the human side. And that's actually the differentiation between the companies who are really successful and the companies who are going to fall behind. Yeah, and I think that also there's another there's a, an inherent challenge built into that now. It's because, in many ways, uh, work has become so specialized. I mean, much more than it ever used to be, where you have you have to have expert you know expertise in so many different areas that ge- it's impossible almost to be a generalist anymore in many areas. And that means, from a leadership point of view, you have to figure out how to bring in all of these different. Uh, different types of expertise and kind of mold them together and and make sure that you get the right outcome. Yeah, uh, on one hand, I'm going to have to slightly disagree with you, which is I actually think people have to become much more of a generalist. And the reason is whatever your expertise was, if you hold on to I'm the expert, then the next wave of iterations of new startups of new technologies is going to pass you by. Mm-hmm. In the in the 21st century, nobody has the should have the expert status in the mindset anymore. Where they can go instead of I know it all is I can be a learn it all. Right. And what that means is even though I'm an expert in this, I have to understand systemically how that impacts over here and how that impacts over here. So I have to learn a bit about all the places that I impact because otherwise I can't do my job. That siloed thinking is all 20th century stuff. <laughs> yeah, no, I, 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 I agree with you there. What, what, I'm, what I'm more getting at is the fact that, um, that the complexity has meant that you have to go out and get lots of different types of expertise. And here's another challenge is that often the expertise you're going to need is you're only going to need it for a short amount of time or periodically. So I think the other challenge that a lot of organizations are facing now is how do I leverage variable resources like outside con- contractors and stuff, as well as in you know internal resources and how do I strike the right balance? Yeah, it's a really interesting problem that people are facing. So again, as they're starting to make that shift, they're starting to figure out how do we actually upskill our current mm. talent And how do we outsource some of it and keep it really lean, right? You'll start to see the hierarchies, they're going away. Everybody's going towards a much flatter organization. We want teams of teams. We want to be able to pull in an external expert on something. And also maybe it's project-based, right? And we work on this project and then we want to upskill our people to be ready to handle this new project. That's why letting go of being an expert is, is probably the shift that I would say managers and leaders have struggle with the most. All for employees, that's a big deal because they want to feel I'm a competent mm-hmm. and expert and you pay me sure, money sure. for my expertise. But for leaders to actually let go of and make the switch to, I am not the person who knows everything. I don't tell you the answers anymore. I'm the facilitator of knowledge coming together from all these disparate places Mm -hmm. and making it come together and making it sort of shine. And I'm just the facilitator of that. Yeah, no, and and I think that's a, that's an extremely important point to make, and I think that is a struggle for leadership because, um, you know, once upon a time, you you felt obliged as a leader in many ways to sort of sort of be well, I kind of know everything, but I don't have time to do everything. Therefore, I you know I have other people to do these things, but I still kind of know it, and I can direct it to the point where I have no clue how this part works, and that's why I'm asking you to figure that piece out. And yeah. my job is bringing somebody somebody used an interesting analogy with me recently was um, that work in the future be more like um, making movies. If you think about how movies are made, right, you know, there's, yeah. you know, there, there's the producer, there's the director, they bring in, you know, a cinematographer, they bring in all these. And, and that's why you see at the beginning or the end of a movie, you see like all these different companies and sub companies and that were involved. And it's really like the producer's job is to bring all these disparate things together to work on this big project. I mean, it's exactly that, right? And the hardest part is as leaders, we're so used to certain skill sets that made us successful. 
right? So yeah. if you grew up in your early career, I work with, I, I obviously I work with high performers and they're um, really used to overachieving, right? They're mm -hmm. used to, I put my nose down, I get things done, I make things happen, right? And now they have to completely shift. Not only are they not the ones doing that they're facilitating, but as you mentioned, they have to let go of the control. I don't even know if what my team's doing is the quote unquote right thing to do. Yeah. Which leads to more of this idea around, can I be comfortable with, again, being a learn it all with experimenting? And this is the emotional shift for leaders. I, I'm sorry to talk about emotions, but it's actually what you need, <laughs> um, is how do I feel okay and comfortable when everything around me is uncomfortable? So if we're on a movie set, brand new team, I need to yeah. form together as a team ASAP and get everyone working together. I don't know what that's going to look like. How do I get comfortable with that? How do, I, how do I experiment and go with that? That's the shift that leaders can start to make. Yeah, no, I think that's a fascinating point. Um, I love that you bring up emotion, you know, talking about emotion with somebody from Ireland where that's a subject we don't like to talk about a lot. But <laughs> no, I, but, I'm sorry, it's actually no, the, the thing. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I totally, I totally agree with you. And I do think I, and I think that's a critical point to to tease out here is the fact that this is emotionally challenging for leaders who have been in leadership positions for quite a while. Um, because it, it is it is a big shift. And no matter how we might, we might like to think that, oh, yeah, we're very, we're very good at bringing in other people and inclusive and all that. The letting go of the expertise bit, the letting go of not really knowing, the focus more on trusting the result and the outcome as opposed to being into the minutiae of the process. That is all tough stuff. Ooh, you, uh, you're alluding to the big E word, which is ego, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. I, I liked being an individual high performer. Mm -hmm. Okay, you can hear from my accent. I'm American originally, <laughs> although I live in Switzerland now. I liked being a high performer. I didn't want anyone else slowing me down, right? If I can do mm -hmm. it, I want to be rewarded. I'm the individual. Doesn't work does not work in the 21st mm -hmm. century. You're going to have objectives and key results, OKRs, with your team. It doesn't matter how you perform as an individual. And that hurts my ego. You know, who's going to pat me on the back and tell me I'm great, <laughs> right? I, I'm, yeah. I'm sort of joking, but believe me, no, I'm no, in the no, minds of executives. True. It's what happens. They don't no, want to No, I give think you're right. Up. No, I'm not, you're you're hundred percent you're hundred percent correct, and I mean, and it's a very it is a very difficult it's a very difficult transition, um, and I guess that's where you mentioned the ego word, so I guess that's where the H word, the humility piece, starts to come in, and uh, and that's and that's hard too because and at the end of the day, let's face it, I mean, it's hard it's hard sometimes to trust people, and I think the trust factor is the other thing. It's like yeah, I've got all these people and they've got great skills, but unless I'm controlling all elements of it, I'm not, I don't really trust that it's going to work. Yeah, I mean, exactly. And so to give very practical tips for anyone who's listening, mm -hmm. when I'm coaching leaders and I'm helping them to make this transition, I say, think of your, think of everything you're doing. Like Simon Sinek said, start with why, then you get to the what level. So what is it that we're going to do to try to make that why come to life? And then don't touch the how. Let the other team, you know, let your employees, let your teams go out and do the how. If they're doing something, a how that makes no sense to you and is way off base, I challenge the leader and I say, that means you weren't clear enough in your why or your what. Mm -hmm. And if you want to stay in control, quote unquote, still directing, still adding the most value that you can, don't dig into that how. Go back and say, where can I correct my what or my why to make it really clear for them? So that's a really tangible way of changing. I always do the how and I look at the how to making sure you're getting everyone aligned and rowing in the same direction. Yeah, I think that's a fantastic piece of, of advice because it is as one of the other things that's really hard, I think, for for leaders and um, and this is particularly like for entrepreneurs and stuff is really, really hard is is when you hand off somebody to hand off something to somebody else and you let go of it. So that's the first step. You let go of it. But then they do it differently than you would. That's the toughest part. As you said, like you have to you have to ignore the how as long as they get the result, because that because how many times have you heard some somebody go, oh, well, I gave it to them, but the, the way they were doing it, I just took it back and did it myself. 
So this is a perfect example of keeping a 20th century mindset versus switching to a 21st century mindset. 21st century mindset is where can I create the most value for the stakeholders, the customers, the end users? Could you do that work better than your employee? Probably. Mm -hmm. I, you know, is that where you add the most value? Probably not. And so the question is, can I get, you know, brave enough, courageous enough to let go? Is that, can I get that good enough and then add even more value over here that makes it worth it? And that's the mindset. How can I always be creating new and meaningful value? Yeah, and, and I think that's a great, uh, that's a great point. And I'm, I think that's a process that probably too many people don't go through is talking about where do I add the greatest value for the stakeholders, for the customers, for who's ever on the receiving end? Because to your point, if you focus on that area, then you don't have time to be sort of saying, well, you know, Lisa, I, I would do it this way. Try doing it this way. I wouldn't have time for that because I'm too focused on, on where I'm creating the real value. Exactly. And so I do a lot of team coaching, working with teams mm -hmm. that are usually they're performing all right. They're not the like, you know, problematic teams, but they're right. performing all right. They know they have the potential to do better. And we look at things and the very first thing that I work with a team on is what do your stakeholders need from you? And then we would organize all this other stuff about what silo you're in and who you report to. We could change all of that. The customer doesn't care. Yeah. What the customer cares about is what's the value you're creating for them. And by the way, most people forget to think, what does my future stakeholder need and work backwards from there? They just answer, what does this person need at this moment? And we can solve it using the same old systems. Hold on. What does the stakeholder need in the future? Now we work back. Now we can figure out what's the internal systems. But mm -hmm. so often we're internal focus and then output is just like, we hope they get the best we can give. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I love you brought up that actually I did. I was interesting. I did this um, lean office uh, certification some years back over the University of Michigan. Nice. And, um, and one of the things was you go through, uh, you know, like lean manufacturing, like lean office, when you map out a process, and you do it properly, and you time it and all that kind of stuff. And then you realize there are all these handoffs and things. One of the questions that they asked is they would say, Okay, why do you do it this way? And you Give, come up with the reason and then say okay if one of your customers if you said to them twenty dollars out of what they are paying goes towards this part do you think they would pay that and obviously the answer is well no of course they wouldn't they'd be like that's ridiculous but to your point they don't care about these things we care about these things and we have to stop caring about these things and care more about what they care about if that makes sense that was a lot of cares about yeah. but <laughs> <laughs> but, but you're spot on. Everything should be. I mean, there's a reason that Amazon is, you know, the trillion dollar company. Mm -hmm. They're doing things right. And they know customer obsession. And how do we get operational excellence is also very important. Yep. But it's first customer obsession. What does the customer want and need? What serves them best? We figure that out then only backwards based on what they need and not just what we think is the right process. Exactly as um, yeah. you mentioned. And, and to your point, so and to your point, that was 20, that was real. If you think about the late 20th century, and even the early like 21st century, what were a lot of companies doing, they were figuring out how to make everything work for them, and not for you. So how many times did you have the experience where you could never talk to somebody you were sent here and there, you would, the company was putting up digital barriers as opposed to using digital to bring you in? Yeah. And I, I mean, I would be remiss if I didn't bring up something that I think only now are we really understanding during this pandemic time, which is also a part of being a 21st century leader is being able to take care of your well-being and recovery, right? Mm -hmm. It's not just how do I serve? How do I give customers? How do I give to the team? How do I because you're always on, you'll get emails at 3 a.m., you'll be called into meetings on a Sunday, right? So where are, how do we, how do we keep our well-being top of mind? And because of this, I've actually been co-creating an idea with a good friend of mine. He's the retired chairman of Microsoft Europe, Jan Mulfeit. Um, and he and I have been working together on this concept called mental restoration. And the reason that we created this, I feel like it's so important to share with everybody because yes. most of us, what we do is mental rest, 
Okay, so what, what does that mean? John, at the end of the day, you're like, okay, I gotta take a, you know, a break. I'm gonna go sit back or I'll, maybe I'll go do yoga and maybe once a week I um, have a spinning class, right? It's a, a, it's a one-off sort of idea of what can I do that decreases stress. But mental restoration is actually more about making sure you're, you're constantly staying at a level of good well-being. I think the easiest way to describe this is like a credit card. So if on mm. day one, you're working hard, John, you've got all these interviews for your podcast all day. You're exhausted from talking to us, right? <laughs> energized. And so maybe, I, like to, I like to say energized, but yeah. Great. <laughs> energized and exhausted, right? But, yeah, but maybe yeah. the toll on that, on your yeah. physical well-being, mental you know, mm -hmm. ability, maybe that's you know, 300 debited. Yeah. And so at the end of the day, you sit down, you watch TV, fine. And maybe that gives you a hundred back. You're still negative 200 and you carry that to the next day, right? And so if every day you're either maybe just breaking even or you're going lower, some days you go really low, what happens when it compounds? What happens yeah. when you get to the end of the month? What happens when you get to the end of the year? What happens when you get to the end of your career? And I'm sure you can imagine, I've actually had to get training on how to coach burnout. I don't specialize in burnout, but every person that's a leader today is sort of going through some form of a trauma right now, and they have symptoms of burnout. And as a responsible coach, I have to learn how do we treat that. So I want to go on the proactive end and say, restore, find ways to keep your well-being levels at least at baseline so you don't ever get to the point where you're feeling burned out. Yeah, I, I think this is an incredibly important point that you that you've raised here, because I mean, I totally agree with you. And I think people are suffering burnout and leaders are suffering burnout at a, at a, at a rate probably never seen before. And, and part of it, I think, is also is that we live in this strange culture where um, we're bombarded all the time and it's almost a pervasive culture tells you not to take time out, not to be with yourself, not to take time out with your thoughts. It's like, you know, you need to be on all the time. You need to be connected. You need to be on your social media, all of this stuff. And I think we've gotten away from taking time out, as you said, to, to, to restore and to be with yourself. And I think that's the hardest thing is I think people are so afraid of being with themselves right now. <laughs> you know, John, they, they did research. This is totally true. I can't make mm -hmm. this up. People sitting alone in a room would rather give themselves electrical shocks than just sit <laughs> quietly and alone in a room by themselves. <laughs> uh, yeah, I can believe it. <laughs> and this goes to um, how we deal with our emotions. I know I said the E word again, emotions. Yeah, I know you did, but that's okay. If, <laughs> But we have to, we're, this is, we're humans, we're not the machines. This is what differentiates us, makes us better and creative in some ways, but we also have to take care of our systems in the way that they're designed. So if I'm um, uncomfortable with uncomfortable feelings, I don't like feeling like a failure. I don't like feeling overwhelmed, right? I don't like feeling like I'm doing a bad job. So I'm just going to avoid it or I'm gonna work harder to try to get past it, right? And it's that constant, I don't wanna fail, I'm afraid of failing, I don't wanna face that I'm afraid of failing, so I'm just gonna keep moving. <laughs> yeah. And to have that time, that reflection space to pause, I, I can't even tell you half of my executive coaching clients, they don't actually come to me to solve a problem. They don't say, oh, I wanna get better in this or I mm -hmm. wanna improve this. They say, I just need accountability to have a reflection space and time dedicated because I don't do it enough on my own. I avoid it, right? Yeah. And, and everybody who's avoiding it will never be able to get to that mental restoration level because part of restoring is clearing out whatever the feelings are for that day, saying goodbye, moving on, and then getting back to baseline. Yeah, no, and, I, and I, like I said, I think this is incredibly important because I love your point about compounding and the basically we're, 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 our credit cards are maxed out, our emotional credit cards are maxed out and we've forgotten to make payments anymore. And, you know, we'll have collections agencies at the door next. Um, but it, it is an incredible, incredibly important because I think that that is one of the keys to not just to leadership, but I think to success in general is going forward given the world that we live in if you're not taking that time out to be with yourself to self-reflect to relax properly to disconnect uh, 
you're, you're not, you're, you're, there's only one way you're going to go is eventually you will flame out. And, and not even, you know, on the very far end, it's burnout. For the everyday folks, you're just not going to be able to perform at your best. Yeah. And who wants to, sh- like, I'm afraid of failure, so I'm going to work mm-hmm. hard, and then I'm going to put myself in a position to fail. It doesn't make mm-hmm. sense, right? <laughs> no, it doesn't. So we have to, we almost have to break that cycle and have the courage, right? I, I coached a woman last week, and I, she came in, and it was 10 minutes of just offloading. And I said, okay, let's breathe. Right? And I'm not one of those breath type of people, but physiologically, we just need mm-hmm. to breathe. And after a minute of breathing, it was like, okay, I can do this. Right. And if everybody can just learn to take those pause, have the courage to know I need to pause and take that space for myself, it's in service to your performance and your achievement and how much you can really give of your best. Yeah. And and just the last question I'd ask you is um, the self-awareness one. Right. And this is something that I um, I talk a lot about because uh, I think that a lack of self-awareness is the greatest obstacle you'll have to success in any in any area of your life, but particularly in, in work. And yes, it's not a pleasant experience to go through a, a period of um you know, examining yourself and going through a whole self-awareness process. But I think for success, particularly in the 21st century, self-awareness is so critical. Absolutely. I mean, here's the thing. If you don't know who you are, you give up your freedom, your choice, your autonomy to actually run your life. Because again, we're humans, our brains work in a certain way. We have our habits, we have our patterns, we have the amygdala that takes over when it does. And if you don't do the self-awareness thing and you don't have sort of a, a consciousness where you can say, oh, hold on, that's my envy coming in. Let me pause that and let me move on to this then you're not actually in charge of your own life. So I almost say self-awareness, it's not just, oh, you need it to be successful. It's you, you need it to be you. <laughs> <laughs> That's a fantastic point. What a great place to end on. And, and I, agree with you compl- I agree with you completely. Not an easy thing to undertake, but probably the most rewarding thing you'll ever do for yourself uh, is to go on a little bit of a self-discovery journey. Um, Listen, Lisa, this has been fantastic. All of Lisa's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, please share a little bit more about what you do. Um, I do executive coaching, leadership development, really focused on creating 21st century leaders, teams and cultures. So anything we can do to get you happy and excited in your work, motivated, uh, you know, empowered to be able to take decisions, creative innovation, get you there, get you performing. That's us. <laughs> yeah. And and I'm a big believer in, in coaching. And I think that if there was one thing to give yourself uh, now in the 21st century, uh, more than ever, is... Uh, as I always say, you probably invest money in your hobbies. You probably have people who give you lessons in this and lessons in that. Invest some money in your profession and your career. Go get yourself a coach because I just think it's so quick. I think it's so hard to operate completely alone these days that I really highly recommend checking out people like, like Lisa and looking at coaching and make a little investment in yourself. I'm biased, but I agree. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, listen, my name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine, Pipeliner CRM. uh, CRM. Thanks, Lisa. And thank you all for, for watching. And I will see you all for another interview really soon. Thank you.